Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to talk about the new book from Adrian Allen, which is his second book um, on McCartney, and then I'll talk about my expectations of McCartney 3 at the end, I think. So uh, the first book uh, came out last year, I think it was, and this is volume two, and he's already got a volume three, I think, coming up at the end of the year. So what he does is he picks 50 songs for the first book and another 50 here, and he goes through them and analyzes them, and he's very knowledgeable on the musical side in particular, in terms of the chord structures and uh, such like, to the extent where one, it sometimes goes over one's head because the, the language is quite technical, but uh, he always brings it back down to earth at the end of each chapter with a, a section discussing the song in general. Um, which is not too technical at all and uh, so I, I haven't read the whole thing I've just been dipping into it and uh, naturally gravitating towards my favorites um, interesting song selection he's, he's not afraid to cover obscure songs he's not just picking the hits although there are several hits in here such as uh, silly love songs let him in say 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 is, is in this book um, but so is deliver your children from London town and Long-Haired Lady from Ram. Uh, so Long-Haired Lady is a good one to talk ab about because not one of my favourite tracks on the album, but interesting uh, to see it analysed by Adrian. And um, at the end it says, um, it's got a little anecdote from Ram's recording engineer, Eric Wanberg, or Wanberg, who says, I remember playing the song back to Paul in the studio. He rested his arms on my shoulder after hearing it. And as I turned and looked at his face, tears were rolling down. Paul is a very, very sensitive person. Listening to his vocal work with Linda really got him into it. It was amazing. So um, Adrian says that this song is the perfect encapsulation of the romantic, magical, and sometimes offbeat relationship between Paul and Linda McCartney. So yeah, uh, it's interesting. Uh, probably still not going to be my favourite song, and I think the ending is um, a bit too similar to Hey Jude, etc, etc. But um, that's the beauty. Everyone has their opinion. And uh, one thing I will say is Adrian isn't, isn't very often critical at all about a song. He, t he tends to give the benefit of the doubt to most uh, things Paul does. The closest I think I've seen him criticise a song is saying... Um, the B-side of Wonderful Christmas Time, Rudolph the Redner's um, reggae. He says, um, little more than a curiosity does not bear but repeated listenings. But that was about the strongest I've, I've found Adrian saying. Uh, so then we've got Dear Friend. Um, is a sincere and touching portrait of a broken friendship, whereas the emotion communicated in too many people concerns vitriol and anger Dear Friend communicates a sense of loss and regret. This is achieved through a variety of musical devices, most notably the song's minor key signature, a mournful tempo, a descending bass line, and a vocal melody that falls and then rises to an expressive peak in the upper part of the tenor range. Houston's orchestration is subtle and under understated, but reaches an emotional apex in the final verse. So that was nice. Um, as I say, I haven't read everything in this book yet. By the way, there's a very interesting interview with Jeff Britton, the Wings drummer from 1974, um, where he talks about recording Genius Farm and Sally G, and um, also the One Hand Clapping film from 74. And three songs from Venus and Mars. Uh, he doesn't remember playing on Love in Song, but he was, I think that was one of the ones he's supposed to have played on, but he does remember Medicine Jar and Letting Go. Um, I have to say, there were a few missed opportunities in that interview to, for him talking about why he left the band or um, what he thought of the various members of Wings, but maybe Adrian was being diplomatic and, or maybe Jeff said, I don't want to badmouth anyone, I'd rather just keep it non-controversial, which is fine, but uh, I think if I was interviewing Jeff, I might have dug a little deeper or probed a little deeper. Um, uh, anyway, that's that's okay. Um, here today, 
the second shortest track on the Tug of War album. However, within this short time frame, McCartney manages to communicate an astonishing depth of feeling. The strings contribute to the sentiment of the song without falling into the trap of sound and sounding maudlin, and this is testimony to Martin's skill as an arranger. It is also no doubt because both Martin and McCartney were keen to create a sincere tribute to a former friend and colleague. Martin understood how the cello was the ideal instrument for conveying grief. Its melodic inter interludes in here today sound like a cry from the heart. The song still carries strength, even when stripped down to acoustic guitar and voice. And the true wonder of here today lies in McCartney's creative process. He instinctively evokes a conversation by following the natural rhythms of speech, as well as its varied phrase structures. On top of this, harmonic choices involving frequent reference to diminished, half diminished and minor chords, and the occasional recourse to major chords, imbue the song with a wide palette of emotions. Here today is a perfect encapsulation of grief, loss, and the happier remembrances of times past. That's well written, Adrian. Um, Through Our Love, one of my favorites from Pipes of Peace, is a song of extreme contrasts. After a very unassuming beginning, the last chorus is one of the most more bombastic episodes in McCartney's solo repertoire. The military elements bear some resemblance to McCartney's orchestration of Tug of War, the title song of the previous album. To set a ballad with such fervent and regal instrumentation is a bold move. Only the listener can judge if the result is a success or if the song sounds slightly overblown or excessive. Through Our Love shows an inventive approach to song structure. It begins with a series of fragments and full starts and eventually cohere into, that eventually cohere into something more substantial. Of particular note is the contrast between the first section, which is based on descending chord progressions and the ascending chords of the chorus. The use of four bars of the verse to provide the last four bars of the chorus is an inspired move on McCartney's part. The reuse of an earlier part of the song provides a satisfying sense of coherence to a song that initially seems to lack direction. This reuse of harmonic and melodic material in a new context emulates techniques that are commonplace in classical music, such as in the development section of sonata form. The Pipes of Peace album has been criticised for lacking both the substance and consistency of Tug of War. Despite what has come before, Through Our Love represents a bold and expressive ending to the album. So that's a spirited defence. Um, to look forward to reading the rest of this, uh, it's a really w well written book. Adrian writes well, he's very knowledgeable, and look out for his other, his other book, which has got the same title, just called Volume One, The Beatles After the Beat, Paul McCartney After the Beatles, A Musical Appreciation. Um, so now we're on to the expectations of, of McCartney 3. Well, uh, there's been no shortage of hype already and people getting excited about it. I'm managing my expectations because I expect, in all honesty, for it to be the weak link in the trilogy. How could it not be after all? This is 40 years after McCartney 2 came out. This is McCartney album. This is the archive edition. Came out in April 1970. And then we've got McCartney 2, which came out in 1980, uh, early summer, and here we are 40 years later with McCartney 78 years old recording the album during lockdown. I mean, one is, tempting, one is tempted to be excited by it just by the fact that it's called McCartney 3, that it might reflect some of the glory of those other two albums. Not that McCartney 2 is the greatest album in the world, or the first one, um, but they're both, you know, pretty high in my if I was to do a ranking, I tend to prefer the first decade of McCartney's post Beatles career to the to what came after. But um, uh, I would be amazed if McCartney three is anything like as good as McCartney one or two. I might be wrong. I'm happy to be proved wrong. Uh, the last album, Egypt Station, was such a mixed bag, from the sublime to the ridiculous, that uh, one just hopes that he avoids writing songs like "For You" and "Come On to Me," although. One wasn't encouraged by the fact that one of the new tracks is called Lavatory Lil, I think. Uh, doesn't sound too promising. Um, but anyway, if he comes up with stuff, stuff like Despite Repeated Warnings or Dominoes, then we'll be in good, sh in good hands. Um, so I did notice, I can't help feeling that he's, he's preparing all this PR stuff and he's sent uh, bags of dice with the, the three on it um, to the, the music editor of Rolling Stone and probably several other journalists have received the same thing in the post and 
I've noticed that people are already starting to talk up the album six weeks before it's even come out. So one is one can feel the avalanche of uh, many, many unwarranted five star reviews coming this album's way. In a similar way to the Dylan album, the last Dylan album, Rough and Rowdy Ways, received like every single one review was five star. I think from, from one, which is maybe four and a half. And uh, I have to say, a couple of months in, I think at best it's a four star, and probably not even quite as good as that. Um, so one tends, I think the journalists, because they're kept sweet by the artists, sent goodies and stuff, they tend to write more favorably and they're less objective than they should be. Um, I've noticed quite a few older artists getting uh, five star reviews. I think Bruce Springsteen's just got one as well. I mean, maybe it's good. I haven't heard Bruce's new album, but. Um, some of Paul Simon's recent work received the same rapturous reviews and not quite as good in my opinion, but it's all subjective as they say. Um, one is almost tempted to wish that McCartney 3 is an instrumental album and that's a bit cruel because Paul can still sing within a limited range, but um, he does struggle. His voice is obviously not what it was and the uh, same goes for Dylan and everyone else I guess, but uh, how could it be? Um, but I wouldn't mind if there's quite a few instrumentals. In fact, there was a little clip which Paul released just recently to, to tease people about the album and the instrumental bits sounded pretty good. And then when McCartney came in on the vocal, one's first reaction was, oh dear. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I'm keeping an open mind. I'm not getting that excited because I think one is bound to be disappointed if one builds it up too much, but uh, it's going to be obviously a bonus to get a new McCartney album, especially in this miserable year of lockdown where the highlights for me have really been uh, the two Doctor Who animated releases, Faceless Ones and Fury from the Deep, um, probably been the highlight of the year for me. Um, so it's good to see Paul back with a new album. Maybe it's his last, maybe not. They've been saying that for the last few years. Um, knowing him, I'll just keep going. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, the jury is out. We'll, we will see and uh, evaluate it when the time comes. So thank you for watching. See you next time.